Hello, everyone, and welcome out to a new episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Geeky, episode three. Uh, actually, I know. It's episode 326. And before we get into today's show, just a big FYI that our show is part of the It's All Been Done Presents Network, or as I like to call it, the IBDP. Yeah, you know me. And speaking of the IBDP, yeah, you know, I love movies. And I feel that movies are a big way for friends and family to bond. It is fun to discuss the aspects of a good or bad film. And that is exactly why, exactly why, Amanda will give you that with the Oscars are my Super Bowl podcast. But wait, what? The Oscars are my Super Bowl is not called that anymore? It's, well, Bob, what could it be? (laughs) Well, Nick... Aren't you lucky you asked? It's now been from the ashes rebirthed anew with the same great content just with a different name. It's Amanda's Picture Show a go-go. She brings different guests with her to watch a movie and talk about it afterwards. The rules are simple. At least one person should have never seen the movie before. That's it. Join the discussion. It's all been done anyway. So check out IBDPresents.com. All right. So... Let's talk about some of the shit I do, or SID. The SID, y'all. UTMNT, go to utmnt.com and read Ultimate Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Check it out, it's pretty great. And of course, the magically unauthorized misadventures of Rocky and Boinkle. Uh, we do have a date for our next show. It is May 6th. That's Free Comic Book Day at Pack Rat Comics. We don't have an exact time yet. Bill, I'm going to assume it's going to be between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. in terms of start time. So um, make sure you stay tuned to our Facebook page, our Twitter, or Pack Rat Comics Facebook page. And you can check out more information about Pack Rat Comics by going to PackRatComics.com. See, isn't it funny how it all just kind of worked out there? Mm-hmm. Pack Rat Comics has tons of board games, comic books, graphic novels, toys, you name it. And not just the, you know, the normal toys. I'm talking about, like, fun, awesome geek toys. You know, like NECA figures. Love, like, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Every time I have to, I have to say it like that. If not, I don't pronounce it right. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Gremlins, amongst others. They have tons of anime, board games, t-shirts even as well. It's pretty amazing. So be sure to check out PackRatComics.com. Our final sponsor is Audible. Go to AudibleTrial.com, get a 30, I'm sorry, AudibleTrial.com forward slash good bad geeky, a rather important part for me to forget, honestly. But if you go to AudibleTrial.com forward slash good bad geeky and sign up for that 30-day free trial, you get an audiobook part of your trial and you get to see what audible is all about and look if you are like me and you have a rough go at it in terms of just you're busy all the time and but you want to read a book and you don't have a time to read the book well then audible is the best thing to do because you can now like a podcast listen to your listen to your book i mean how how gnarly is that i think it's pretty gnarly at least <sighs> c'est la vie de l'amour so with that being said, let's talk about one other thing. <clears throat> I am part of the Mad Lab Ensemble uh, for this show. I'm a guest star. Uh, I should say that's probably poor wording on my part. But the Mad Lab Ensemble invited me as a guest star to their current ensemble for this particular show. It's called Sketchy Sex. And it's the first sketch comedy show in almost five years at Mad Lab, written by the actual Mad Lab Ensemble, not whatever the hell I was trying to say. It's everything you wanted to know about sex and some things you probably don't or didn't. There you go. So uh, tickets are $10 for Mad Lab members, 13 for students or seniors, or for general audience members, it's $15. So come out, be part of the show you know what, get that membership for Mad Lab and pay $10 in all future productions instead. It'll be pretty awesome. Uh, The dates are Thursday, March 9th, Friday, March 10th, Saturday, March 11th, Friday, March 17th, Saturday, March 18th, March 23rd, and then Friday, March 24th. Guys, it's really a lot of fun. Um, I don't want to say that, you know, there, there could be singing body parts, um, it's it's really funny, and it's I am so honored. You've you've heard me talk on the show before about how you know I really uh, I've not done the acting thing in a while, and last I think uh, I had to take a break because I was so overwhelmed in a good way. It was very much a good way because um, you know, they. 
they kind of asked me to make sure I, I try to audition for Theater Roulette and and this other production they have. And I was like, I I just can't. I can't. I, I am swimming with what I'm doing in Sketchy Sex, which is, is not a lot. There are other people that are doing like three or four sketches because they're part of the main the actual Mad Lab ensemble and they're phenomenal um, and it's so much fun to see these people work and become friends with them and it's so much fun you guys and it's really raunchy fun so again come out sketchy sex for more information go to madlab.net or if that's wrong I apologize go to Google type in Mad Lab Columbus and you'll find the information there but I believe it is madlab.net because when I get my tickets I go online and get my tickets that way I don't have to show up and take a chance that it might be sold out. So, woo, yeah. All right. So before we get into what I want to really talk about on today's show, I thought we'd just kind of go over the news you don't care about. It's a, I'm, I'm, I brought that segment back. It, it's a lot of fun, for me at least. And also it's just, just like, hey, here are some thoughts on things that are happening out there. And you know what? You probably don't care about it. That's why I care. So you don't have to. I feel like like that's from something, and I don't know. So if that is, you know what? Email me. Let me know. Goodbadgeeky at gmail.com or Twitter at goodbadgeeky. So Peter Capaldi is leaving at the end of Series 10 of Doctor Who when Stephen Moffat leaves. And I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of sad. I really feel like – yeah, I I think he did say it was his decision, but a part of me feels like it's not – I don't know, and I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Um, I feel like Peter Capaldi's first season was not very strong, and it's not his fault. I felt it was actually more um, against uh, Moffat. Uh, I didn't feel he wrote the character or got him into shape well enough. You know, I often said on this show that I didn't care for Matt Smith's first season. Like, there are a lot of things there that I like about Matt Smith. Um, like, Matt Smith kind of grew on me. Um, there were things, things that I didn't like, and it's it just inconsistent to me for the first season of Doctor Who. And the first time I watched, you know, his run, his first season with Amy Pond and Roy and all that, where um, Amy recreates everything in the universe, uh, it in my head I was like, oh, he had to act that way so she could get to that point and recreate everything. But when I rewatched again with my with my now wife, it was kind of more like, oh, I just, you know, I didn't really get that same vibe necessarily, and um, and again there were things I I completely forgot when I rewatched it, but um, that were again some of the stuff was really good, and and Smith brought a real natural. I think he found a way to override some of the inconsistencies, but by that point though, I'd already liked Matt Smith, so. That could be something else as well, but um, Capaldi, I just felt like he, he had, an un, un, sadly for him, not not a good way to, to enter the show um, necessarily. Like, uh, well, again, it's like Matt Smith's final episode. Did not care for that whole final episode. And again, um, one of my co-hosts, Jimmy, disagrees with that, and I understand. I and I kind of understand his viewpoint, which is, if I remember correctly is it's kind of because, you know, it's like he he's the longest living doctor and, you know, he deserves to go out um, with something, just protecting something, something so small and, 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 and well, it seems insignificant, but really it's not. And, and I guess part of it is we were, I was wowed by these big last storylines, like that kind of ran multiple, well, kind of ran multiple episodes, like season one, uh, well, or series one of the new Doctor Who, you know, uh, for some reason, my mind's going blank on him right now. But uh, the ninth Doctor had the whole storyline of the Bad Wolf, right? And it accumulated in him turning into David Tennant. And then David Tennant had the whole the 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 sounds uh, was it the I'm not uh, see I forget the title of it, but you know the whole thing with the Master coming back and the the sounds of war, the drums coming back, and the Time Lords trying to come back from the past and um. I mean, it was just, it, oh yeah, it, uh, he who kills you will, it will ring three times or something like that. And it was just heartbreaking. It was so, so good. And I feel like with Tenet, we got to see humanity with our Doctor, like a real humanity, like that a side of humanity that you don't see in Doctor Who, which is he doesn't, you know, he's kind of selfish. Um, even though he is a good guy, He there is a part of him that's selfish for his own life. And you don't usually see that with the Doctor. Um, and it was a refreshing change, and I think it made him very human. Um, 
while with the new Doctor Who, Peter Capaldi, you know, he got a bad rap. He did this whole thing where he was grumpy. He was an old man and he was grumpy. And there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, you can make him lovable grumpy. And it wasn't until, honestly, I think it's the first episode of Series 9 where he came out on that tank rocking the glasses and the um, the guitar in in a castle, which I was like, okay, this is awesome. And that, to me, it feels like Peter Capaldi's doctor. Like, it, you know what I mean? It feels like it's fully, um, you know, and, and that, that just that first season uh, uh, with him was just, it was really bumpy. So I digress. James Cameron will regain the rights to Terminator, oh God, in 2019, and says he's going to godfather the next film in the series. Uh, Cameron says, It's really just stumbled along, trying to find its voice again. There are probably some degree to where it's lost relevance, you know? Maybe the thing that made it good back then are kind of a yawn now. It's easy to remember fondly the things that kick off a franchise. It's hard to keep a franchise vigorous and relevant. I haven't had my hand on the tiller since Terminator 2, and that was 1991. So what's that, 26 years? But look. I think it's possible to tell a great Terminator story now, and it's relevant. We live in a digital age, and Terminator, ultimately, if you can slow it down, is about our relationship with our own technology, and how our technology can reflect back on us, and in the movie, literally, in a human form that is a nemesis and a threat. But also in those movies, in the two that I did at least anyway, it's all about how we dehumanize ourselves in a time when people are being absorbed by their virtual social world. I mean... Just look around. I always say, if Terminator was about the war between the humans and the machines, look around in any restaurant or airport lounge and tell me the machines haven't won when every human you see is enslaved to their device. So, how could you make a relevant Terminator film now? Could you? Absolutely. Yeah, so, I don't know. I I just remember, um, I think the last film would have actually been mildly entertaining, and they could have actually made the, the franchise that they wanted to, continue the franchise the way they wanted to, um, if they would have just kept the secret of of John Connor. It, it was such an interesting twist where he became the bad guy. Because, um, look, it's that whole thing from Batman. No one ever thinks they'll live long enough to become the bad guy, right? And... I thought that was such an interesting thing. Now, granted, it was it was messed with the, by time travel, but that's such a fascinating uh, and possibly parallel world. So, it was really fascinating. But they ruined the they ruined it in the trailer, and I'm just like, why are you doing this? I thought it was a very poor choice. It's like when DreamWorks did Megamind. I still stand by this. It's it's a perfect example of how movies today. They ruin things in the trailer. Um, not always. I really, I think Jimmy has a different opinion on that, which I, I do kind of respect. Um, <coughs> but I'm not bothered by spoilers as much. So, you know, like, for example, the Guardians of the Galaxy 2 trailer. I remember we were at Jimmy's, actually, and we all watched that. And it was, a, I, I, it was, it was A, it's fun because it's a communal experience. But B, like, it looked good. And I don't think it spoiled anything. So... I feel there are ways to get stuff you want out there and talk about it. Now, look, if it was something in Terminator where John Connor was the bad guy at the opening of the movie and for like five minutes and then they saved him or something like that and like that was the twist, well, that's fine. But that's not the case. The twist was he he is the bad guy. He becomes the bad guy. He becomes the thing that he hates. It's just so frustrating. And also, I really thought that oh, was it Terminator Salvation with Christian Bale was actually really good i really like the idea that this guy thinks he's a human but he's really a terminator which they kind of blew that in the marketing of that one too so it just really it really grinds my gears when they do stuff like that you know where they ruin a twist in a movie so okay so vera formiga uh if i hope i said that right um she i absolutely loved her in up in the air um, she's go- joining Godzilla 2, which is still called, at least at this time, Godzilla King of the Monsters. She'll play the mother to Stranger Things, Millie Bobby Brown, wife to Kyle Chandler from Friday Night Lights fame. And, uh, guys, I'm kind of excited for this. Now, uh, Gareth Edwards is not directing, which is kind of a bummer, but I'm not going to lie. You know, after watching uh, Rogue One, you could tell, uh, like, he is a wonderful filmmaker, but s- plot and story maybe not as strong suit. Now, there are some other things that I think it's interesting that we could talk about during a Rogue One. We could probably do a second Rogue One 
um, podcast where we discuss discuss it a little bit more in depth um, about Gareth Edwards, I feel like, um, because there's a lot of controversy surrounding that, but we're not going to do that here. Um, speaking of other large beasts, King Kong has a new trailer for his new movie for Kong Skull Island, and there's a lot of new like pop music, and I mean, I'm talking about like old school pop music, like 70s pop music. Um, there's one song in there they do animal the animals uh we gotta get out of this place we're gonna get out of this place gonna make a better life for me and you that's why you turn into this podcast so you can hear me sing and just laugh and talk about all the joys that is the animals new hit single we got to get out of this place. But no, seriously, it, it looks really cool. And actually, I feel like it looks more action-packed than Godzilla did. And I, and I feel like, and this is just me, um, as a big Godzilla fan, Godzilla, right, has to, they had to kind of win the audience back, I feel like. Um, and granted, I think there were budget concerns, too. I, I don't doubt that. Um, but I really feel like, they, like Gareth Edwards was correct in that we have to win the audience back in showing them who Godzilla it actually is and how terrifying he can kind of be. Um, and he kind of follows what M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong does during his movies, which is something taken from Hitchcock, which is you don't always show everything, you, you uh, or you don't always tell everything, you, you show it, but you don't show it exactly, right? And I th- and I think by that time that you see Godzilla at the airport, and then you f- really see him when he comes on t- on to San Francisco, that's when the movie kicks into gear. Now, granted, he's again not in the movie that long um, officially, but it's more it's more dramatic in that way. Now, again, sad part is too is that the human characters are really lacking, which is a bummer. They killed off Brian Cranston way too early, way 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 too early. Um, you know, they should have had him stick around until the end and maybe die in the, towards the end of the movie. Um, but I digress. Um, I know It's good to know that Brian Cranston kind of feels the same way, but he's like, hey, I will do, I agreed to do this role. I will, I love Godzilla. I will do whatever you want me to do, which is, which is pretty cool to say. I remember, I think he said that in the Nerdist podcast he was in a year or two ago, which I thought was really awesome. Um, cause you know, some people, it's a paycheck movie. Like, if I was in a Godzilla movie, I'd flip the fuck out. Like, even if it was just a cameo. And, and, you know, if, wouldn't it be awesome if Kyle Chandler and Vera Famiga were really big fans of, of the kaiju? You know what I mean? It, it would be pretty sweet. But they're probably not. And that's okay. So it might be just a paycheck movie. Um, so, and that's okay. But there are times, though, when you know the actors enjoy the property. And then, you know, it doesn't always turn out the way they would really love. But it's like, you know what? I just, I, I, A, I agreed to do it, and B, I just, I love the monster that much. Let's do it. So, pretty darn cool. Okay, so now, let's talk about what we're really talking about. And we can't really talk about the Oscars unless we'd say how buku crazy it was, wasn't it? I mean, like, mad crazy. Like, soups, totes, craze, craze, y'all. Part of me feels like it was the fault of Kimmel uh, as a prank gone horribly wrong, though, all the evidence shows otherwise, but yeah. Okay, so for those who don't know, Living Under a Rock and all that whole thing, there was a massive Steve Harvey-like mix-up at the Oscars. And if you don't know who Steve Harvey in that mix-up was, well, then shame on you. YouTube it right now. But that mix-up at the Oscars was where Moonlight, a film I still haven't seen yet, though I'm hoping to soon, actually won. But La La Land, every time I see La La Land, because uh, I have my notes here, like the films, it's like Moonlight, La La Land. I Every time I look at my notes, I almost go... L.A. L.A. Land. Oh, Jesus. Um, anyway, La La Land was called up to the stage, uh, and the presenters were Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway, but it wasn't called by Warren Beatty. Everyone like shits on Warren Beatty right now, but it was Faye Dunaway. And Warren may have, if Kimmel is not to blame, grabbed the wrong envelope. Um, actually, they're saying now it, someone else gave him the wrong envelope, but you, if you watch the video, he did a double take, and... And it's it was almost like he's an old you know because look he's like what in his seventies and has like what teenage daughters, you know he's just going like what what what's 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 going on oh my, and he, and, he, and you see him show it to Faye like are you seeing this are you seeing this and uh I mean he was completely surprised and perplexed and like what was he reading and and then he shows it to Faye and Faye looks at it and just like. 
said something like, oh, you're so impossible or you're just, uh, really like you're doing a bit right now. You're, you're, that's horrible. So then she's like, la la land and boom, shit went off the charts crazy. The actual clip of it happening was so great in retrospect because I remember Emma Stone was just in the background going, oh my God. 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 And Ryan Gosling, you know, I just think found the whole fucking thing hysterical. Like, like really this. Wow. Wow. The director and writer of La La Land did not seem to find it funny. I just remember every shot that he was in, in the background, he, it looked like you, it looked like you punched him in the face, call his mother a whore. And then, you know, spilled his guts out on the stage. That's what it looked like. And, um, which I'm not going to lie. When I hear interviews with him, he kind of comes off like a pompous jerk and that's not fair to him at all because I seem like a pompous jerk for saying he's a pompous jerk, right? Oh, the wheels of the internet, but enough of that craziness. Uh, out of all the films, I think that I was actually, I usually am most excited about because usually th- I feel like I'm more vested in these films nine times out of ten. Um, but of all the films I'm most usually excited about for Oscar season, uh, from start to finish, it, it's the Academy Awards choice for Best Animated Feature. Um, now, look, there tends to be one or two films that jump uh, out and above the pack in all the categories, though. Uh, one is always subject to heavy opinion and uh, that doesn't always agree with everyone else. And usually I'm on the other side of that. I'm on the side of, I'm with the group think, right? And I feel like this time I am in the majority that feels against the grain. And and surely, that that's okay. It's okay. So for those who don't know, the Academy Awards uh, had a category listed for the hall, uh, which was, um, Kubo and the two strings directed by Travis Knight and Ariane Sutner, uh, Moana, John Musker, Ron Clubbins and Asnat. Sure. And there's probably more. It looks like my life, excuse me, as a zucchini, Claude Barris, red turtle, Michael Dukak, DeWitt in Toshio Suzuki, and then Zootopia, Brian Howard, Rich Moore and Clark Spencer. And the true victor of the category has already been listed in the halls of legend forevermore, but we're going to talk a little bit more about this. And can I just say, rest assured it has nothing to do with Moana. I recently saw Moana and while I enjoyed the film at the end of the day, it was a pop. It felt very popcorny, which is again, fine. It, it felt like very, it felt like light and fluffy Disney fair. Um, I felt like they were, if it, to, again, this is me, it felt more like they were trying to be more true to the culture it was trying to represent. It had a few decent, wonderful songs from the Hamilton writer, uh, Lynn manuel but the film ultimately had, that's not true. It, it did have a purpose, but it didn't feel like it had, I think it, it really did suffer from a lack of a clear villain. Um, now, you can argue that until the cows come home, and I think we probably could on another episode, and we might, um, about how the idea of that, you know, Moana needed a villain. And now, granted, you could also say that Maui was kind of the villain. You could also say, uh, I'm going to mess this up, Kabakor, the crab, or the crustacean, was kind of a bad guy. Or you could say that um, the weird fire demon, Hawaiian fire demon, was, um, but wasn't the villain. But... I digress. Uh, this has nothing to do with Moana, so take heart, dear listeners. Uh, the film that I that was really speaking to me as, or were really two films in particular, and and that is Zootopia and Kubo and the Two Strings. Now, what is particularly interesting about that is I'm an individual who uh, made the comment uh, in a past episode of this very program, not another pro, but this very program. And I made it very clear that I think Zootopia deserves the Academy Award for best animated feature. Uh, it was very like, just no bones about it. Now, granted, I have not, I've seen Zootopia like four or five times. Um, and I've seen Kubo and the two strings once at that point. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm in the, in the, I'm going against the grain. Everyone wants Kubo to win. And even the reviews and, and from critics and whatnot I've heard is that Zootopia is a Disney saturated film that comes comes close, misses the mark from being actually Academy Award winning. And apparently I am, and I am. I'm against the grain on this one, which again, it's perfectly fine. But in that same episode I made that comment here on the show, I did not elaborate on my theory. So 
thank you to one individual, Joey B, who actually emailed me asking me for to expand on that just a bit. So I need to be fair. I went back and rewatched both films, and I sat on them for probably a week or two. Uh, no, granted, I, that's easy for me to say because I've been so busy with rehearsals and all that. But I did. I sat down on it, and you know, and I, I realized I'll, I, from there I can proceed with my diagnosis. Uh, you know, so. Were both movies equal and the same? Uh, Zootopia, on the surface, is a tale about a cop and a con man, or fox, uh, who get involved in a drug ring that is hurting the citizens of the luxurious Zootopia. Underneath that surface is a surprisingly noble and valid attempt to talk uh, to people about race, difference, and how, well, you know, difference is, you know, the rest. Kubo and the Two Strings, though, on the surface, is a film that has a little boy who may have an amazing gift that has to fight the Enchanted Mood King and seeks assistance from a monkey and a beetle samurai. Underneath the surface, that film is about loss, memory, family, and, well, I'm really not doing the film any justice, so I'll just stop there for a second. Looking at both films, you know, they have a lot to say, but in very different ways. And while one is timeless, one has something a bit more important to say. At least, at the moment. And that is why I still stick by the idea that Zootopia deserves the nomination and thus the win for the best animated feature film in the 2017 Academy Awards. And since, and since this is recorded almost a week after, I still say it deserved to win. Now look, let me say, go. I'm not done yet though. Well, we can laugh and have a grand old time laughing at the sloth, flash, flash, 100-yard dash. There's something almost sinister that plagues the story's characters, which in our mind, it's very much racism. But it's very subtle to younger eyes and ears, but it's very true to us adults. And in today's political climate where, in the current context of the movie, we have the herbivores who have possibly gone out of their way to accommodate the predators. And in our society, we've kind of done that, which because it's the right thing to do, you know, the you know, and again, I'm getting very political here, so I apologize. I don't mean to be, but I really feel like that was the biggest thing with this last election, which is a proof of that here in America, which is the white man feels like we've accommodated other people and races too much to make them feel equal, and now they feel put down upon by anyone who isn't white, which of course is a bunch of crap in my opinion. But again, that's that to me is really the consensus of what the problem is. You know, we've for so long held the hands of middle America saying, you know what, we need to, we need to, and rightfully so, consider the freedoms of not just white men, but black men and women, or not just black men, but women as well, black men, or blacks, Asians, Latinos, you know, and because we are all born free, it is our God-given right, you know. But anyway, the point is, is that that film speaks to what right now is important, and what really matters right now and i think it does a grave service to the children of america it helps them more you know while with that said both films have points that are classically based one is more set in the past regarding hints of japanese culture the other is steeped in the past but is also very much in the present concurrently than you would expect it to be and and here's the other thing too What's really great about this topic is that both films deserve to win. It's fuck. I mean, it's why they're nominated. But to be the actual proponent of the award, well, shit. I think it still deserves to be Zootopia. Now, let me go further. And this is probably going to be more controversial. Well, you know, for a movie conversation. But I do not find Zootopia to be the better movie. Look, that isn't true. I personally feel that Kubo, for ages to come, will be a movie that will be watched and viewed and will be timeless. But Back to the Future didn't win any super big awards for story or best film. And that film is, from start to finish, a top-notch story that delivers everything it sets up from point A to point Z. And then it goes back in time and does it all again. Now, I'm not talking about Back to the Future 2 or 3, though. Those are good movies, but the first film is a... Is a, is a pinnacle of filmmaking and storytelling from the script even to the final product, which is the film itself. But if Back to the Future didn't win anything like that with the claim from the Academy, Kubo possibly may not either and did not. And you know what? That's okay. Because here's the thing. People, in my opinion, remember Back to the Future way more and they'll do the same when it comes to Kubo and the two strings. Now, 
Just a reminder, while Back to the Future was nominated for Best Original Screenplay, it didn't actually win. So again, what I'm saying is, I feel... I feel like this has merit. Look, Zootopia, by default, will be remembered, but at some point, the possible laurels of what it's trying to achieve and say may be lost when it comes to a point where we are no longer at war, we are no longer prejudiced against others, where love, memory, and friendship are important above all else. And it is here where Kubo will rightfully find its place even more so like the tale the film itself tries to speak to, which is being passed down from family to family, friend to friend, human being to human being, Right, cemented eons before when it was released as a truly phenomenal film. And I feel that history will tell you, not any marketing machine from Disney to back it up, that like the Iron Giant who preceded it and the DeLorean, Kubo will go down the annuals of history as the film that time will truly remember for all time. While Zootopia is the film that we needed right now, and it will also help that Disney will ruin it by sequeling the shit out of it, Kubo is the film that we deserve and and what we will always deserve. And thus, it will be more potent when we watch it. Okay. That's all I wanted to say. I, I really do stand by that. I, I feel that Kubo is the, more, is the better film. But I feel kind of like Iron Giant, Back to the Future. These, these are films I feel like last longer and have something more to say in the long term. It, they're very basic. Now... Kubo is the, one of the most original films I've seen in a very long time. And they accomplished that with wonderful storytelling. They didn't talk down to the audience. But again, I, again, I keep saying Back to the Future, but I feel it's the same way. At no point do Zemeckis and uh, I think it's Bob Gale, at no point do they talk down to, your, to the audience. There are very subtle things that everything pays off in. Now, Grant, I do have some small problems with Kubo and the Two Strings. Um, and they're just... They're just little things, but I, I got it. I got. And mostly, it's with the ending, um, between the battle between the Moon King and Kubo, um, with the eye. I, that was really my my only thing, which is I figured that was something going to ha- was something that was going to happen. But at no point did he talk about the eye, and then he just has the eye at the end. And I'm like, okay, um, I get what you did there. And again, it was just, it, it, but that wasn't the point of the movie. Not really. It was, it, I digress. Anyway, enough of me babbling. The Oscars have been long since out by now. And you can see for yourself who won if you missed uh, out when I said it like 50 times earlier. But perhaps you have thoughts and that's okay. As a matter of fact, I want to hear your thoughts. Um, and not the weird one about where you wonder about the squirrel who got stuck into a Venus fly trap. I think there's a video on that on YouTube. No, no, no. I want to hear about your thoughts on how crazy I am for saying Zootopia deserves to win over Kubo uh, and the two strings. You can do that by just emailing me at goodbaggeeky at gmail.com or tweet us at goodbaggeeky. Or you can call us. Uh, let me pull up the number. I Every single freaking time I'm going to try to do this, I, I can't remember um, to do it, so I apologize. But you figure I'd have this freaking prepared and ready by now. Every time I forget. 614-364-4088 or you go to gbgpodcast.com and there is, you can also Skype us. You can leave us a voicemail on Skype and we'll play it there as well. Also, next few episodes, um, I just want to apologize in advance. Um, with everything going on, uh, I had a queue built up for GBG, and I have now blown that queue. Um, I'm trying to get the queue back up again, so um, <sighs> water refreshing. But I'm trying to get the queue back up, and um, and and you know the response to the show has been really great. I think February has been our biggest downloads month. Um, in the year, but also it, it usually February, January, February, and March. Like even when I update in January, uh, for those who who may not listen to the show regularly, or they they're like your time travelers listening to everything from the past. So yeah, if you're time travelers listening to everything in the, in the past, um, I mean you know that, uh, or you may not know, I should say that. We usually take a break around Christmas time. I didn't this last year. I, I didn't, or I took a smaller break. And, you know, we came out big dick swinging at the knees. You know what I mean? And we, I had like, like six to seven episodes built up in the queue, and I've blown through all of them. Uh, but part of that is just because I've been preparing for Mad Lab, preparing for Free Comic Book Day. It's all been done. I was been, I've been running, which, by the way, the March 11th show um, next week is, or actually tomorrow by the time this goes out. Or, if, again, if you're time travelers, it's in the past, so don't worry about it. But if it's not the past for you listen it's gonna be great but yeah so you get these things of oh man um 
So, yeah, so I apologize in advance. With everything going on, we might have to skip a week or two, but please note that we have a lot of great stuff we want to talk about um, coming up, and we've had a lot of good responses to having different people on the show. Um, so uh, my goal is to always get Jimmy and Nathan on the show because they are the true co-host of The Good, The Bad, and Geeky, and I'm talking outside of freaking Judge Jimmy, which is awesome, and our GBG Live, which is held at Mad Lab before it's all been done radar. But it's fun to get some other different voices in there, and a lot of people also really respond responded well to the filler fighters episode which is amazing i really loved having austin and anthony on so i'd like to have them back too I'd like to have a dallas back and a few other people as well so stay tuned it's going to be great but if we have to miss a few weeks here in march i apologize and trust me i will find a way to make it up to you maybe we'll do two podcasts a week for just a bit um so I digress, like I always do, because if it's not a really good GBG show, if Nick doesn't say at some point, even in a joking manner, I digress. And now Nick is talking in the third person. So Nick wants to say thank you for listening and see you around. Get out of here without cheese! You're a creep! Go away! We're having a good time until you start up, cheapers! Go have some coffee with cream or something, because I'll tell you something, this is a happy place.